Hi, everyone. Hi, my name is Marley. Last year, I got very sick, and my arm was paralyzed. So we built this. Hi, everyone. The story started about 18 months ago, um, when in the span of just a few hours, my daughter turned from a fun-loving little girl we always knew to a girl who was struggling to breathe and whose body was being paralyzed. By the time I got to, the, to her in the hospital, which was about five hours later, her left arm was completely paralyzed. She could barely breathe, she couldn't eat, she couldn't sleep, she couldn't stand, she couldn't walk. Um, and we really didn't know what was going on. She was, uh, she was diagnosed with acute flaccid myelitis, a rare polio-like condition. And there was only about 100 or so cases of this before my daughter got ill, and so our doctors really didn't know what was going on. That night, we researched all we could about acute flaccid myelitis, and we found some um, some researchers and some specialists that had treated this condition before out here in California, and we had a good conversation with them. We also looked on Facebook and we found a group of parents who had uh, kids with the same condition. There were about a hundred or so kids that had had this before in, in the US. And we found that there was no cure. Um, we also found that the, the only treatment available to her would be physiotherapy and occupational therapy. But the, the chances of rehabilitation were very, very low. Only about two, two kids had had a, a significant recovery. Most of the kids we knew and we saw were still in wheelchairs, were still in respirators. A lot of them had limbs that were completely paralyzed. And so there wasn't much hope for us. While we were researching, we also found some other projects, though, some projects that were building exoskeleton suits for paralyzed individuals and helping them move. And we also found some other devices similar to this um, to, to help my daughter move, but they were extraordinarily expensive, $50,000, $100,000. Um, they were extremely, extremely bulky. They, weren't, they didn't look pretty at all. <laughs> and and they, they weren't very useful, um, nor would they have fitted my, my daughter, who was quickly growing. So we decided to build our own. But we didn't know where to start. I'm just going to put this down quick. We didn't know where to start. I mean, we, we knew that her left arm was paralyzed from the shoulder down to her wrist. Her wrist was still moving and her fingers were still moving. So we, we knew that. Um, we also knew that because her shoulder was paralyzed, whatever we built, would need to be light enough so it doesn't pull her arm out of the socket. So we, we set a limit of about 150 grams, and we wanted to make sure that it could continually pick up uh, about 400 grams worth of weight over a, a number of hours. And, and we wanted it to be completely mobile. And then lastly, we wanted to make sure that we could somehow pick up the, the muscle signals that were still going to her arm we noticed that when she was in the pool, she could move her arm one or two degrees either way. And so we knew there was a signal going to her bicep. We just wanted to figure out, can we pick that up? Can we somehow pick up that signal and use that signal to, to control this robotic prosthetic arm? And, and if we can do that, then we could force her to continually send signals to her muscle and, and, and hopefully uh, increase the chance of rehabilitation. So we came up with this, with this really simple design. We wanted to 3D print the braces, we would, we would get some type of actuator motor, but we really didn't know where to start. We had 101 different questions. Um, so we recorded some, some videos asking experts for help. Um, we had a number of, of different questions, you know, how, what batteries should we use, what should we do? And within a couple of weeks, we had experts from around the world trying to help us. Um, from South Africa and Germany, we had experts in, in battery and electronics. Um, a friend of ours in California helped us scan her, her arm so that we had precise measurements. Uh, a company called Actuonics donated a bunch of actuators to, to our project. 
some students out in, in Columbia University helped us to design the, the, the appropriate uh, joint mechanism so that there would be sufficient torque to pull up her arm. And then from Mexico, uh, Jose, who's now a really good friend of ours, had, had now helped us to put this all together. And so with all of their help, uh, a number of weeks later, we had this very rudimentary prototype built. And this is actually built with Fisher Technique, which is kind of like technical Lego to toy. Um, but it worked. So it was a prototype that was able to pick up her arm. The sensor wasn't included. So this prototype just, just uh, showed us how it could work and, and how the, the mechanism in the joint could work. At this stage, we also started to document everything we're doing. We realized that there were 100 or so parents that had kids with similar conditions. We wanted them to be able to see what we were doing, and, and we, could, we could collaborate on this work. So we started to document everything we were doing and posting it online. And these are some of the pictures that we, that we put up online, different instructions, how to make a plaster cast, what to do when the 3D model comes, how to start to assemble it how to mount the actuator and the electronics, and then how to wear it and where to place the sensor and, 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 and everything. But there's, there's a whole lot of instructions and videos and everything on the, on the site. But we still had one key challenge, is how do we pick up this signal? Um, because we, we just simply couldn't. This is a chart or a representation of a chart of what it looked like, what the muscle signal looks like from my arm. So I had the, the muscle sensor on, and you can clearly see when my, my, when my arm was relaxed, when I'm picking up my arm and when it's relaxed again. And then what we would do, we would normalize that signal and then apply a threshold to that signal so that when the signal reaches a particular threshold, it would trigger the actuator and trigger the, the arm and pull it up and push it down. And this really worked well on my arm, but when we tested it out on Lorelei, this is what we found. This is, this is what her arm signal looked like. You can barely see any difference between when she was relaxed and when she was actively trying to pull it up. So this was a huge challenge, a huge roadblock for us. When we started to apply a threshold and we started to try and work things out with this, the, the her twitching of her finger or her arm or whatever, whatever the case may be, um, that, would, that would cause the, the, the actuator to trigger and the arm to come up. So this was a, a huge roadblock. So we set up a, another video. Uh, we recorded another video and we, we said, you know, can we use something like machine learning and pattern recognition to somehow look at the, the raw signal coming from our arm to, to, to have an algorithm recognize if we, can, if we can find, you know, when she's trying to pull her, up her arm and when she's pushing it down. A few days later, we came across a company called Coapt. Uh, who were doing, doing something really, really similar. Um, they were using pattern recognition to help amputees um, use prosthetics. And they were really kind enough to send us this evaluation unit. And so instead of us using just a, a singular sensor, we used 17 sensors. And we pushed all of this data through a uh, pattern recognition algorithm. And over time, it, it was learning how to pick up those signals and translate it into uh, instructions for a virtual arm. And so here you can clearly see that um, her arm isn't able to move, but we are still able to pick up enough signal and use that to control this virtual arm. So after a few months, we, we, we had this working model, this working prototype that was able to, to pick up the signals from her arm and use it to control the, the, the prosthetic arm. But the, the story didn't end there. Um, a, short, a few months after we had this all done, uh, Lorelei comes up to my wife and I, and do you remember what you said? Ow. She said, hey. <laughs> I'm sorry. She said, hey, mom, dad, look. I can use my arm again. She could use her arm again. And so, so this was this was obviously without the without the arm, without the the arm brace. 
So now she's, she hasn't needed to, to use it anymore for, for the last couple of months. Um, Um, but the you know what we built isn't all that special. The the technology isn't isn't that great. It doesn't work all the time, and there's still some major challenges to overcome. But that wasn't the biggest thing. I think the biggest thing was it provided us tangible hope. Without this project, we would have been spectators. I mean, sure, we would have taken part in OT and PT, but we thought that there would be such a slim chance of rehabilitation that it seemed futile. You know, when we brought her home from, from the hospital, she was like a six-month-old. We had to help her walk. We had to help her get dressed. She couldn't uh, use her arm at all. Um, she struggled to eat. We had to, we had to give her baby food. Um, <laughs> and she had to have a water bottle uh, next to her at, at each stage because she, she battled to swallow. Um, but this project gave us gave us that hope, it allowed us to dream of maybe a 10, 20, 30% recovery, and, and now we have this. So, thank you so much. Yeah.